Who in this audience is familiar with this book that has been very trendy in the last couple of years, this whole getting clutter out of your house? Okay. Anybody besides me have clutter in your house at all that you were like, I should get rid of some of these things? Keep what gives you joy, right? Isn't that the premise? And if it doesn't give you joy, you throw it out and put a free sign on it in the driveway, right? Well, I think this is how we're coming to look at medications very often. There are a lot of medications in your garage that are difficult to get rid of, that seem to just keep lingering around and not really doing anything happy for you. And so we start looking at deprescribing through that lens. So how do you get all that stuff out of your house once it started accumulating? Because it's definitely a lot easier to put somebody on a medication than to get them off of it. So deep prescribing becomes a big emphasis. And we are very fortunate today to have a pharmacist who's got a great perspective on that subject. Please join me in welcoming our very own Leah Garris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like to know who I'm talking to, so how many of y'all are nurses? Great. Good happy hour friends. So. Uh, social work? Okay. And pharmacists? Uh oh. Okay. Uh, any uh, PCPs or physicians by training? Okay. All right, and then if I left a profession out, anyone else want to shout something out? Uh, we have community health workers. Oh, perfect, yeah. Um, I work with community health workers as well, so. Um, okay, uh, so as Paul mentioned, um, I'm a pharmacist and I go see people in their homes primarily or wherever they might live. I uh, spend most of my time at house call providers, so I have very close relationships with those primary care providers, but I also work with our ACE team, which is a wraparound team that um, sees patients, uh, it doesn't really matter which clinic they're at, um, as long as they're a care organ member. Most of my patients are in the safety net population, but they, house call providers does have some patients who are, are not. Um, so. Really, I'm just gonna break down for you what I do. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. So the first thing I do is form a relationship. So when people come into my care, um, they have a really long medical history and I am just getting to know them. So at that point, I consider them the expert on their body and their healthcare. I'm not the expert. And I'm also aware that I'm walking into a complex social um, situation. Usually when people have advanced illness, there's someone in their life that's either helping them or they're so isolated that they would immediately qualify for a higher level of care, whether or not they choose to accept it. So really understanding how this person is operating in the community and who they trust and who, who is getting them their medicines. Who do you call when you can't get a hold of them? And then um, my personal strategy is to ask them about their pets if they have any, and I usually show them a picture of my pets. If they have children or grandchildren, I'll ask about that. And I just find these things to be neutral topics that uh, kind of lighten up the mood and and just help me to get to know them as a person, and it's, it's usually a neutral topic. I've also met um, several cats, dogs, and pigs while um, doing this work. <laughs> so as far as Miranda is concerned, um, I would probably be seeing Miranda after her cancer diagnosis, and so the challenge with her at that point would be how do we treat pain um, especially cancer pain in the setting of a history of um, substance abuse. And it is possible we do it. Is it risky? Yes. Does it make people feel uncomfortable? Yes. Which is why it's so important to have a team of people who are experienced and grounded and, and can move forward. So when I talk about medication beliefs or healthcare beliefs, this is a little bit different from motivational interviewing. What I'm talking about is changing a medication, and that may or may not also be changing a behavior. So if that medication is attached to a behavior, such as injecting your insulin, or please inject your insulin, 
that's changing a behavior. If it's, I'm gonna discontinue you off this medication and you believe that they're going to do it, then you're simply changing a medication, not a behavior. Um, there are some limitations to motivational interviewing. This, as the social workers know better than me, is designed to change a behavior, and everyone has to have a consensus of reality. That means we um, are lucid to some extent, and so it, some of my patients have advanced dementia and delirium, severe cognitive impairment, and motivational interviewing would be quite difficult in those people. Uh, so people in palliative care get asked their goals many, many times, and I often find that they sort of have a canned answer that they're giving back to me, and it's not really my job as a social worker to, or as a pharmacist, I'm not a social worker, to elicit their their goals or like to fill out a pulsed form. So I find that asking about their medications is sort of a back door into understanding what's making this person tick and function. And as a pharmacist, that's what I do. So I ask them which medications are most important or helpful to you and their answers help me understand what I might be targeting in this person. So people who are interested in quality of life might be fixated on having their pain medicine. My, if I can't have that pain medicine, I can't function, I can't watch my grandchildren, that is critically important to me. Uh, or possibly their mental health. Um, nausea and vomiting is a terrible, terrible symptom to suffer from and I believe it increases suicidality if it's not controlled, so it's very, very important. Um, on the flip side, if they say something like their oral chemotherapy, and even though it makes them nauseous, if I don't take my oral chemotherapy every day, I could die. So that's, that's a different goal that I'm hearing from that person. Same thing with a cardiac medication or a warf like a warfarin. You have to take a blood test every two weeks when you're on warfarin. That's really important to you? Yes. Okay, this person is interested in, in maintaining their health and probably aggressive treatment. Then I ask them, what medication gives you the most trouble? Some people don't really engage with their medication list and they have someone else administering all their medications and so they might not even be able to tell you. They're like, I don't know, I just I take a handful every morning, um, which is common. Sometimes they list a medication that they're not getting and uh, people oftentimes fixate on the lack of something. We hear that a lot and then Sometimes it's a medication they perceive that's not working. Well, my doctor put me on this inhaler and I still can't breathe. And also I, get, I hear a lot of GI complaints as well. So um, sometimes I, I focus on what's giving them the most trouble because in a list of 20 medications, you have to pick something. <laughs> and then a, I kind of touched on this earlier, but are you able to afford all your medications? And this helps me gain insight into how resourced they are. Sometimes people really, really don't have a dollar to spare on an over-the-counter medication. That is really the situation we're in. Sometimes they do, and so I like to know how much freedom I have in sort of prescribing things that might be outside of, of their prescription coverage, or if I need to be calling a social worker and like trying to access like patient's assistance funds and things for this person. And then, kind of a general feeling overall, how do you feel about taking 20 medications? Or how overall do you feel like your medication uh, regimen is, is like helping you live your life? Sometimes it's met with ambivalence. They can't really say if it's good or it's bad. This is just the life that they're living. Um, sometimes it's met with confidence. And when I say self-efficacy, that means the belief in yourself that you can, you can actually do the things that you set out to do. Some people's self-efficacy is appropriate. Some people's self-efficacy is inappropriate. So sometimes people are very confident that they have this and they're independent, but they don't really have that insight into themselves. Um, and then occasionally they feel like they're burdened and that's a great opportunity to partner with them. And I can also ask what their goals for their healthcare is. 
and hopefully <laughs> this is going to be in line with which medications are most important to them, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you, you get a little bit of dissonance there where it's like, I want to live as long as possible, but I don't want to take my cardiac medicine and I want to double my opioid dose. So that's, that's a little bit harder to work with, but we come across that a lot. And so you're going to have to acknowledge that discrepancy and sort of break that down and work around it. Sometimes their goals aren't even related to their medications. It's about their housing or it's about level of care. And, and you can change the medicines in this situation. You can make changes, but I think it's important to acknowledge that maybe the overall situation isn't gonna get better until their overall situation improves. So I see that a lot. Uh, it's really easy for me to partner with people who want to stay out of the hospital or the ED. That's where I feel like as a palliative pharmacist I can do the most like, work. But that's not always, some people prefer to go to the hospital and the ED. Some people want to spend time with their family members. They say, well, my husband and I used to go to a cafe and get coffee every Sunday and I can't do that anymore. So if I could do that now, that would be like the pinnacle for me. So that's how I form a relationship. And really, I don't make a ton of changes to people's medication regimens until I feel like I have a good working relationship with them. If they are part of a culture that I don't belong to, if they're, if like for example, if they don't speak English, I usually try to one, figure out how to say their name correctly, two, figure out how to greet them in their language, and three, figure out how to say thank you in their language. And you don't have to do that, that's just what I do, and I've found that it has like a pretty good, I have pretty good responses from them. So next I'll focus on their goals. So now I kind of, since I have this sort of understanding of what might be important to them, how they're operating, then it's time to kind of get to work. So if I started working on one medication problem today, which problem is most important to you? They might say pain, they might say anxiety, they might say shortness of breath. Those are traditional palliative problems that we can work on. But also sometimes they're fixated on a, disease, a perceived disease-altering medication such as Doliresp, which is extremely expensive, and they might not be able to access that medication, and they might be a little bit fixated on it, and we can talk about that because not a lot of care is gonna happen if they're hung up on the fact that there's a therapy out there for me that could help me that I'm not getting, and, and to them that's, a, that's social injustice. So I'm not saying that I'm going to get them that therapy, but I think addressing that is extremely important. And then, <laughs> um, I, I want to emphasize that I focus on the relationship first. When we do functionality and risk factors with patients, this is kind of what I might call like pre-rounds. Like if you guys have ever been in a hospital, like before you go on rounds, and you're like, oh, we're going to pre-round on these patients. We're going to look up everything there is to possibly know, memorize all the lab values that they had this morning, and I'm going to like have like 50 different possible scenarios in my head about how, like, how I'm going to help this patient. And as much as possible, I avoid pre-rounding on my patients. I read their chart, I get a handoff, I know their name, I know how to say their name, and, um, but I really, really try to meet them before I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna solve this problem, I'm gonna solve this problem, because so many times I've walked into their home and what I thought I was gonna do, how I thought I was gonna be useful, was completely opposite than, than how I ended up being useful. But that being said, here are kind of some red flags that I look for. So first, we look, I have a checklist that I, I run down and I check things that might be um, applicable to that person. And then based on what I check off is sort of what I'm looking for in the home. So if they're an older individual, I'm looking for cognitive decline, risk factors for delirium, Certain drugs, um, pain. I mean, I think we, pain is kind of a universal experience, and it only becomes more prevalent as we age. 
declining physical function, falls or fall risk increasing drugs, which often appear on the beers list, but that's not solely what the beers list is designed for. Medical complexity and polypharmacy, an unsafe home environment, and isolation, which is really common in older adults. If they have multiple prescribers, lots of medications, I'm looking for discrepancies, errors, and disorganization. If they have um, lower health literacy or a language barrier, I know to book more time with them, especially if there's gonna be an interpreter there. And I have to go slow with these patients anyway, but like for example, I just last night did a Mandarin interpreter phone call which would normally take about five minutes with a, a standard patient, it took 20 minutes last night. So it, it's gonna take three times longer, maybe four times longer, and just to be aware of that and allow that time in your schedule. And especially if I have a patient who's 93 and they're in a private home and their caregiver is in their 70s and it's likely that this person, their caregiver, is also experiencing some amount of cognitive decline. So not only are things gonna be have to be re repeated and teach, talk, talk back, teach back because of the language barrier, they're also gonna have to be repeated because it, it's possible that the caregiver is also experiencing cognitive decline. Um, these are delirium risk factors, uh, I think Oxygen or the patient being tethered is really common that we see, or if they have some kind of hearing impairment or visual impairment, anything that could disorient the patient is a risk factor for delirium. So oxygen is very important for people to feel comfortable, but also just recognizing a tether can be a risk factor for delirium. Uh, benzodiazepines are a risk factor, or possible risk factors for delirium, but also the withdrawal from benzodiazepines or the withdrawal from opioids, withdrawal from muscle relaxers. And these ones I um, consider to be risk factors for falls. Okay, so now that I've kind of gone through the checklist and thinking like, okay, these are my red flags. This is what I'm kind of looking out for. Then, after all of this, I review the medications. Um, medication list can be quite complicated, and uh, it's recommended to have a systematic approach. So I did see about five or six pharmacists raise their hands in the room, so I was wondering if you guys had a systematic approach to uh, deprescribing that you would like to share. or nurses or physicians. Oh, you guys are so lucky to be here today. Because <laughs> that's what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> okay, this is your last chance. Okay, all right, good, all right. Um, so this is just a structured guide and um, going through a systematic approach is actually shown in the evidence to be um, to lead to more deprescribing than just a general review by a physician or pharmacist. So, if you think, like, I'm a really good pharmacist, like, if you add a systematic approach on top of that, you're going to be an extra, extra good pharmacist. And for your nurses and social workers out there, while you might not be going through the deprescribing, hopefully some of these tools that I'm showing you, you could also use in your practice if you're thinking, you know, if you have a hunch, you're like, hmm, I wonder if this might be causing this. I mean, you're probably, if you know, you're probably right. If it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, it, might, it could be a duck. So, uh, in 2019, there was an update for uh, the most popular uh, medication list that we use to poo-poo drugs in the elderly called the Beers Criteria. And there were 70, 70 changes made from the 2015 version. They were really kind to us and they added um, antibiotics that we often use to treat recurrent UTI and skin infections, which, which really makes my job so much easier. Um, uh, glimepiride, tramadol, um, aspirin. I think aspirin for primary prevention, if you see someone with an aspirin hanging on, then they don't have 
a heart attack, you might, you might question that. I think that that's probably one of the most useful ones that they've added. Rivaroxaban, which is a, an anticoagulant drug. Um, when I see people who are older and they're on Rivaroxaban, I'm actively trying to switch them to a Pixaban. Why? Why? Um, increased risk of bleeds in older adults. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so that there's just new evidence that came out that a Pixaban has less bleeding risk. Yeah. Um, and then they were, they were kind to us in that they removed H2 blockers from the BRS criteria. So H2 blockers were on the BRS criteria for a great number of years because it was thought that they, they could cause confusion in older adults. Well, that was decided to be too controversial to include on the list. So um, that's important to keep in mind if you're trying to deprescribe a proton pump inhibitor or a PPI, that you do have a full license from the beers people to use an H2 blocker. <laughs> um, there's other tools that you can use when you're thinking, what should I stop? Um, so beers criteria. Stop start is like the European version of the beers. Um, and in studies, they've shown when they, they use the stop start criteria um, that potentially inappropriate prescribing was found to be a, at a prevalence of about 21% uh, in, in an older population. And then they also found about 22% of omissions. That was in 2009, so it was a little while ago. The GPGP is actually, I use an algorithm very similar to that one. Um, and they actually were able to stop about 58% of medications in this population, and only 2% of them needed to be restarted. And 88% of the participants in this study reported uh, improvement in global health. So GPGP is what I use, and I'll go into that in further detail. So right now, if you want a tool that shows not what to stop, but how to stop. Um, you could go to deprescribing.org and download a mobile app. I think the app itself is called AIM Medical Guidelines, like in the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. And you would select the bottom, which is deprescribing, right there. This is, these are the Canadians, so good job, Canada. Um, and it's only um, certain classes of drugs. So benzodiazepines are like notoriously hard to stop in people. They're very habit forming. PPIs, which are medications for heartburn, like your omeprazole, uh, your Prilosec, um, antipsychotics, dementia drugs like your denepazil, and antihyperglycemic. So these are like very explicit step-by-step -step instructions on how to de-prescribe these drugs. They make it so clear. This one is for cholinesterase inhibitors. And even you can, there's links within the links, so you can click on monitoring plan and it will explain that to you. So it's a really useful app, especially if you're not feeling very comfortable. Um, another tool that you could use uh, as far as um, like what to deprescribe and how to deprescribe it is you could go to web, or sorry, medstop, medstopper.com, which is a web-based tool, and you put in a medication and then you select the indication for it. And what it pulls up is like so cool. Uh, it's got these happy faces, which I personally love, and. Uh, it kind of tells you like, okay, so this is amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. It color rates it, which is like, should this be your priority of stopping? Red would be the highest. You know, it might improve symptoms, um, but um, it might cause harm. It gives you a taper approach, and then it also gives you um, possible symptoms when stopping or tapering. And then if you click details, it'll show you like more of the studies that went into their justification as to why to stop. Yeah? So just so I understand it, um, the columns with the faces, um, that if you stop it, it may improve symptoms? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, I think he's gonna, are, are you gonna make her repeat the question? Which one? Could you explain more? 
I'm thinking there's a double negative or whatever with yeah. those three columns with the faces. Oh, okay, I understand, okay. So the question would be, could this medication improve symptoms? And the smiley face that's neutral would be like, yes or no, it could improve symptoms. And so could this medication cause harm? The, the frowny face would be like, yes, it causes harm, which you're right, is a double negative, right, yes. So don't think about it too much. <laughs> Just go for your gestalt. Oh, this is bad. Brownie face bad. So thank you for asking. I appreciate it. So now I'll go into my preferred algorithm. Um, this is a, essentially a kind of checkboxes I meet. So if I'm considering a medication or a group of medications, does it have any benefit? If no, uh, does the harm outweigh the benefit? So would the adverse reaction to the benefit that I'm getting outweigh any benefit I'm getting? Um, is this for a disease state that's stable or are the symptoms stable? Uh, this one is really common in palliative care. Is this preventing a disease state that's like we're way downriver from that, like, you know, like, is this preventing a heart attack? They've already had five heart attacks, so, you know, like, maybe we don't need, maybe we don't need to prevent a heart attack anymore, especially if they're, their life expectancy is six months. And then if the question to all of those then is no, then you would continue therapy. But if the answer is yes, then the next question is, is this person going to have withdrawal symptoms from this if I discontinue it? If no, then you can feel free to discontinue the drug. So one might be like potassium. Like let's say their potassium levels are fine and it's causing them a, a tummy ache and I don't expect them to live a very long time anyway and potassium does not cause withdrawal symptoms, then I would just go ahead, discontinue the potassium and maybe check a a chemistry panel in a month and see where they're at. If you do expect withdrawal symptoms, and the answer is yes, then taper. Or you could go to that app, deprescribing.org, and they have tapering plans as well. And then when you taper, you have to monitor for symptoms, and um, you could restart drug therapy if it doesn't go the way you hope it would. <laughs> So it's just some examples. Um, so the harm outweighs the benefit. Dinepazil can cause GI side effects is the main reason why we discontinue it, or just lack of benefit in someone with advanced dementia. Uh, insulin, like especially your short-acting insulins, they're pretty dangerous. Preventive drugs, I think I was alluding to a statin earlier. Um, statins are studied over a time period of like two to five years. So if the patient's life expectancy is less than that, then maybe we don't need to continue the statin. Bisphosphonates are notoriously a pain to take. Like, um, I just barely made it here by 8 a.m. this morning. That's only because I was told I had to be here. So if you asked me to wake up even earlier to take a bisphosphonate um, on an empty stomach, like. There's no, like I'm not, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I don't, I don't see why like a, a sick person would agree to that if I won't agree to it. So uh, yeah, bisphosphonates, especially in limited life expectancy, can do away with it. They can also um, kind of start a prescribing cascade, which would be like a bisphosphonate causes indigestion. So you're prescribing a PPI, like an omeprazole. Omeprazole can... Um, decrease your calcium absorption, which can make the bisphosphonate less effective and increase fractures. So um, you kind of want to be on the lookout for things like that. One kind of caveat in palliative care is often when I get patients, their symptoms or disease state is not stable. <laughs> so that box doesn't always work. And speaking of symptoms or disease states not being stable, how many of you guys are familiar with the 2016 CDC guidelines for opioids in chronic pain. Yeah, really uh, changed practice for a lot of us in palliative care. 
mostly how much paperwork I have to do. Uh, <laughs> I see some nods. So uh, this, this was pretty upsetting uh, to palliative care because I think that people saw these guidelines, they really changed, kind of the, the pendulum swung too far the other way. So it's important to remember that even though health plans have adopted policies in line with these guidelines because they're serving the greater population, which palliative care is a, a subset, right? Um, it's important to remember that these guidelines were not intended for patients with active cancer or who are in an acute crisis. Uh, those ones who are post-surgical or those using medication-assisted therapy for a substance use disorder, which is a lot of our patients. Um, the recommendation does not suggest abrupt discontinuation of opioids already prescribed at higher doses. So this happens a lot in palliative care. A PCP gets a, a patient who's on, I don't know, 500 morphine equivalents daily, and they freak out. <laughs> um, and they say, okay, well, we gotta start tapering now. But if that relationship isn't in place before you start a taper plan, they'll probably fire you, and then end up in the ED, like in acute withdrawal. So it's really important to understand that these guidelines don't sanction abrupt taper plans. And if you're uncomfortable that the patient is coming to you on 500 morphine equivalents, then maybe you shouldn't take that patient if you're not willing to walk with them a little bit before tapering. Um, because it just, it, they're gonna end up in some other place in the healthcare system if the plan that you have for them isn't successful. And not only for opioids have I seen this, I've also seen this for benzodiazepines in people with seizure disorders, and that's actually life-threatening. So um, I would really encourage you to just keep that in mind that the patient who comes to you on high doses of opioids, one, it's probably not their fault someone else was complicit in this, and two, uh, even though no one is comfortable with this situation, uh, in decreasing their opioids by 90% is gonna make it a lot more uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so, and then also uh, the guideline strongly recommends offering medication-assisted treatment for patients with an opioid um, use disorder. And yes, in palliative care, we do have people maintained on methadone and we give them morphine for breakthrough pain if they have, for example, cancer. That's not comfortable, but it's what, it's what we do because otherwise they might use heroin. So aside from addiction, <laughs> um, why is de-prescribing so difficult? Uh, I was really fascinated when I went into patients' homes just how many medications there were. And I was really, I became really fascinated with medication hoarding. The picture on this slide is only a fraction of the amount of supplements that was in this patient's home. It was probably like five times that much. And a lot of them were still sealed in their bottles, 10 years expired. Um, so when we think about medication hoarding or just hoarding in general, um, it, it really starts at the beginning with traumatic life experiences, um, possibly gen genetics or family history. And there's, there's two pathways people can follow when it comes to hoarding. One is beliefs about possessions, and the other is information processing. So some people um, kind of feel the need to control possessions and they get negative feelings when they let things go or positive feelings when they acquire something. On the other track, it's more about cognitive impairment and lack of being able to organize. So what happens is they either have difficulty discarding, they acquire too much, or they're cluttered and disorganized and they could have uh, one or all of the above. 
The interesting thing about medication hoarding or hoarding in general is this little guy from Ice Age. It's ironic because they're solely fixated on this one thing or this fear that they won't have enough. But if he would just look around, like he's on an island, like there's like coconuts that are like five times the size of that acorn. So it's, um, it's really pathologic. So in the safety net population, likely to run into these folks. Uh, and then older adults, again, often have information processing difficulties. People with the, the negative emotions when letting go have difficulty doing medication rec reconciliation and then difficulty discontinuing or discarding medications. Uh, people who enjoy acquiring things might be the supplement OTC collectors. Whoa. And so for each situation, I kind of developed little things that I do. Um, first, you want to build trust, get buy-in, reinforce their locus of control. Like ultimately, it's their; those are their possessions. So legally, I'm not going to take these away from you. And sometimes people think like, "Oh, you're a pharmacist; you're here to report back to my doctor, or take something away." Like that's. I can go home and sleep just fine at night, leaving you exactly the way I found you. <laughs> like I'm not going to take anything away from you. Um, if people are unwilling to let something go, then my next suggestion is to, to sort of sequester the stuff that's not being used and label like what is useful and what's not useful. Like We don't have to throw it away. It's still here if you need it. Let's just put it over here. And then these are the medications you're using. And hopefully they will um, engage with you enough to let you do that. If it's more of a cognitive impairment situation, um, I, I try to make sure they have a clear path that they're able to move around their home. Like sometimes you need to get ADS involved because they, um, you know, we're mandatory reporters. Possibly they need a higher level of care. And like I said, if you're not going to address the whole picture, like you're probably not going to have a lot of success with the medication. And then um, as far as bubble packing goes, which is that long-term care pharmacy, I just would encourage you guys to be very careful about who you would think about initiating this with. One, their medication regimen should be pretty stable, like not too many changes. Additionally, if they're so cognitively impaired that they can't uh, read their medication bottles and understand how to, to um, administer their own medications, they, they might be so cognitively impaired that they cannot follow a bubble pack. Um, I have seen that. so. Uh, really make sure that they know how to follow a bubble pack before you go through the effort of bubble packing the medicines. Otherwise, you'll have the same problem, just a bunch of bubble packs laying around. Of course, limitations of this model would be dependence on opioids or benzodiazepines. And then also, I would like to say like, this is there's a certain amount of reasoned action in medication hoarding. So if someone says, like, I lost my PCP three years ago and I had to go without antidepressants and I never want to go through that again. So now I tell my doctor that I take 20 milligrams of um, fluoxetine when really I cut the pills in half and I take 10 milligrams. So I will never, ever, ever, ever run out of fluoxetine again. Or maybe they're sending it to a family member who lives in a country that can't access that. That is actually a, a highly adaptive <laughs> behavior that's reasoned and doesn't, is, is separate from what I'm talking about here. So sometimes when I see a stack of inhalers, um, I, I don't necessarily assume that they don't know what they're doing, because maybe they do. And I think, I think the key to this is just to stay curious is not to approach any situation where you're saying, I know what's going on here, because you really don't. Um, so to wrap it all up, um, don't expect much palliative care to happen without first establishing a relationship. I target questions to find out what is important to the patient, and then I use that to tailor my interventions. Use a systematic approach. It will keep you organized 
when things are feeling really chaotic. And um, expect that deprescribing will be really challenging. Sometimes it's easy and that's a win, but you don't need to feel bad if it's unsuccessful. You should really be protecting your own professional life and have boundaries around that, saying, I'm gonna show up every day for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna treat you the same way I treat all my patients. And if it's unsuccessful, we can try again tomorrow. And that's everything I have. Leah! <laughs> yes.